So what would happen is uh, the, the clinics, there, at that time there were two clinics, and both clinics were inside the city limits of Pensacola, and, and that's for real, and that's by design because Pensacola uh, has now and had even then, but now to a greater degree, a, a professional police department as opposed to a political organization, which is what a sheriff's department is. And right, right now we have, a, I think, a pretty good sheriff's department now, but back then, uh, it was an elective office, and so therefore, you were very remiss if you if you appeared to be at all critical of what was going on. So what would happen is uh, they, for instance, were, were they passed a sound ordinance at one point. You could not use amplification at the clinics. At the clinic where I were mostly escorted, I escorted at all of them. But the one so, that I so what is what do you mean by escorted? What that meant was the clinics did not have protected on-site parking. So when patients would come in, they would have to park across the street or some other place where the pro-life counselors would cluster around the patients who were coming in and depending upon their mood, depending upon whatever it depended upon, would would do things from please talk to me, please don't do this, you don't want to do this, to uh, you're sinning against God, you're killing your baby, you're doing this, to having people dressed up as nurses with blood all over the front of their things. It was just terrorizing. And they were loud and they had John, John Burt and, and uh, Donnie Gratton were two of the people from that wing of it. And they literally had scaffolds around two sides of the Ninth Avenue Clinic, and they would be on these scaffolds, and they would be screaming. I remember one, one of the one of the most amazing things was there was a mother and father who were bringing their daughter to the clinic, and they drove in. Usually, they would drive into the clinic, and they'd get out, and then we'd get their car and go park their car, and then when it was time for them to leave, we'd go get the car, come back, and this girl. They, they, they did this thing. They saw the car drive in. They ducked down behind the, uh, on the scaffold so they couldn't be seen. The father and the mother, all terrorized, uh, come in. They don't know what to expect. And as they're getting out of the car, they jump out and start screaming at this person. And the girl was so terrified, she dumped her bladder. That's how horrible they would be. They would, well, anyway, there was a noise ordinance they weren't supposed to use uh, sound amplification, but they would decide to do, to do that every now and then. And so what would happen is that the policeman who was there, there would be two, and then later we got th three policemen who would be at the clinic, and so they would call, they could not make an arrest. If something was there, those police could not make an arrest. So they would call, and then the person who, uh, from the police department, who uh, was a head of this, a guy by the name of Jerry Potts, um, he would eventually get out there 20, 30 minutes after the event had happened. And then he would go talk to Vicki Conroy. Vicki, you know you're not supposed to do this. You're not blah, blah, blah. You know, don't do that. And they would give him all this other stuff. And one of the most effective things we did is that we started to do videos. And one of the things that happened is that we then had videos of Sergeant Potts, later assistant chief and later chief Potts. He would be there and he would try to calm them down and be nice to them and blah, 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 because he wanted to run for sheriff afterwards. And he would do that. And what would happen, he would be talking to them and the other protesters would be around the back of him making faces and, and doing all that. And he didn't even know that was going on. So, sorry, um, uh, it, got, it got bloodier. Oh, it got much bloodier. Um, 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 Dr. Uh, Britton, well, in 93 is when Dr. David Gunn was killed. And 
he was killed at the other clinic. He was the main doctor at the clinic on Ninth Avenue, but there was another clinic um, uh, in the Cordova Park area or Cordova Square area, and he would help out over there. And so he came to work one day, and Michael Griffin, who was a protester there, who fell under the spell of John Burt, and there was history there with his wife. His wife had had an abortion. Anyway, he shot and killed uh, Dr. Gunn. And then it was not long after that when another doctor whose name now escapes my mind, but he owned that clinic and had owned another clinic in uh, Fort Walton or somewhere in Okaloosa County. And he also had uh, worked at a clinic in Mobile, and he was assassinated in Mobile. And then, uh, and then, of course, the worst, the the, the biggest thing was when uh, Paul Hill killed uh, Dr. Britton and Jim Barrett and wounded his wife, um, June and, Barrett. And you knew Jim Barrett. Oh, I knew them very well. well how, how did you know them? Well, they, they were both members of the, of the Unitarian congregation. And uh, I, I will tell you a story. I'm going to run you over it, but this is a story that has probably not been told. Uh, a reporter for GQ magazine uh, followed Dr. Britton from Fernandina Beach, where he lived, to Pensacola on an airplane where they were picked up by the Barretts. There were four of us who picked up the doctors at the airport. And I was one of uh, the four at that time. Anyway, uh, this guy who wrote the article uh, sort of centered on Jim Barrett. Jim Barrett was a retired military guy. He was a little, a small man, but he... Kind of scrappy, wasn't he? Very scrappy. He, he was very scrappy. And he had done things like had rescued... Catholic nuns in the jungles of Burma and crap like that. That's the kind of stuff he did. And uh, he was, he fell in love with June. You know, they were both older, but, but they found each other more, much more recently. And she was a retired public health service nurse, had a long career in that. Anyway. Um, June was his wife. June was his wife. And what happened was that it, as a result of that stuff, in the article, the article mentioned that Jim Barrett was this plucky guy and that he, uh, that if anybody was going to shoot anybody, that they didn't know who they were messing with because he, he was um, that. And they were retired and they traveled a lot and so they traveled with a, a, a pistol in their car. So this article comes out and one of the things that I was trying to do, one of the reasons that police don't want to get involved in stuff like this, it's like a domestic abuse. You don't know who's going to shoot from what direction. And so one of the things that we did, we, we went totally nonviolent in every way. And that was one of the things as I sort of rose in, in that was to say, we're not going to have any weapons. We have to, because we were telling the police, we don't have weapons. And because anytime you put a, anyway, we had to make it totally clear that there were no weapons, there was none of that sort of stuff. And it even went to the point is after the doctors were killed, people were sending bulletproof vests, right, to, for escorts to learn. And some of the people uh, in, in the hierarchy of, uh, of, um, feminist rights, that they, they thought this was a great idea, it would dramatize all this other kind of stuff. And Jerry Potts, who was by that time the police chief, he was against it. And, um, and of course everybody would say, well, and I said, no, he's right. Um, that having bulletproof vests is a provocation, it was not a good idea. And I said, maybe everybody's going to vote. And we're going to discuss this and we're going to vote as to whether or not we're going to do uh, bulletproof vests. But I'm against it. I don't think that we should wear bulletproof vests. And then we went, when that article came out about Jim, then Jim, who was one of our most reliable people, I had to go to Jim and say, you can't have a gun. You can't bring a gun. And he would say, 
He says, some of those people are crazy. He says, I've been around a lot of crazy. He says, some of those people are crazy. Something's going to happen one day. I said, Jim, maybe it will, but we, I'm going to the city. I was, I was um, um, coordinating uh, with the police department. I would meet with them, uh, give intelligence. Police departments don't give it back, but you have to give it to them. So, so um, we made that available to them, and and um, and I said, um, I said you just can't do that. Well, what had happened was um, one of the people who was a driver worked out at the Navy base, and he did shift work, and so it came around to where he was going to spend a month on a shift that would not allow him to pick up the doctor. Uh, we have a school teacher who is uh, a now member and but probably the leader of all of the escorts then, and she had a daughter, and her daughter came to an age where she had to, you know, starting school and stuff like that, so she couldn't do it. Um, and the the Barretts, we came up and I said, you can't do that, and and he was not happy with that whole idea, and I said, well, we, we just can't do it, and he wouldn't anyway. So what happens is that for the four weeks prior to the assassination of Dr. Britton and Jim Barrett, they were traveling with family and stuff. So it comes a Friday, and Thursday night, I get a phone call from Jim, and Jim says, Bill, uh, I am, I am, uh, 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 June and I haven't seen uh, Bayard Britton. His name is John Bayard Britton. He says we and he said we haven't seen Bayard in a while, and so we're going to pick him up at the airport and bring him to the clinic. So I said, okay, I'll meet you at the clinic early because we had technical issues with condensation in the cameras. That he did not. We was not aware of it. So and, he, and then he says, Bill. He says, I just want you to know that I'm not packing that I, I, will, I will not have that, and he made that decision. So I didn't, we didn't discuss it, I just, it, it. so of course, the next morning he's there, he picks up the doctor at the airport, they come to get into the, the, the gate at the clinic, Paul Hill is there, and he stands in the way, so that he can look and see who's in the car. And they say, what is he? Is he crazy? You know, he knows he's not supposed to stand there. But the policeman was late. So the cops weren't out there. Uh, so he moves out of the way. And they pull into right where the door is. And June's in the jump seat in the back. And Britton's here. And Jim Barrett's here. And June looks up as Jim is getting out. And looks and sees this and you know when you're looking head on you don't really realize what it but he says she says she says that looks like a and that's when he starts shooting and he shot Jim three or four times he falls down there's heavy buckshot in, in these loads that he had selected the pellets are going through the thing going through the windows glass and everything is flying inside there she goes down to the floor and She's, you know, when, when that happens, she's trying to get underneath the seat. She's just trying to protect her well any way she could. J Dr. Britton says, June, where is the, where's the pistol? And she says, we didn't bring a pistol. We don't have a pistol. So Dr. Britton then is going around like this to just make a moving target. As Paul Hill reloads, comes onto the property, and then start shooting and eventually hits John Britton. She's down underneath there, and the, the shooting stops, and of course she's trying to bury herself under the desk, under the seat, and she looks down and she can see from, she's back here, and can see his heels on the floor of the truck. And she says, Doc, are you all right? Are you all right? And then of course there's a sheet of blood that just comes pouring over the thing and she was not all right. So I got there right after that. And I would have been there had my son not engaged me in conversation before we went. So anyway, so then I get to the hospital to talk to you and she tells me that. And probably the thing, it was not really in my mind, just trying to 
wrap my mind around what had happened. So I, I get in to see her at the hospital. And, I, and so she starts telling me what happened. She says, Bill, what, what happened? Or I say, June, what happened? So she tells me the story that I just told you. And, and I don't know whether she was thinking it or even if I was thinking it, but the thing that she said to me, she, when she mentioned about the gun was not in the vehicle, and the gun was not in the vehicle because I said there wasn't going to be a gun in the vehicle, and he acceded to that. And did she regret not having a gun? No, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm. I'm there, and I'm starting to say something, and I'm choking because I, I. I don't know what to say. And she said, she says, but I want you to know one thing. I said, what that? She said, I am so glad that we did not have the gun in the car. She said, I just hate the thought of spending your last few seconds on this earth grabbing for a weapon. So, and as it turned out, I just want you to know that they selected him because of that article about that and what they thought they were getting was a thing that they could portray as a shootout and they were incredibly upset that he had no gun. 